clever people keep telling me that everything will be electric soon. This fills me with the fear of God, because I don't much like electric cars. But there's now a race among some makers to prove that electric can be exciting, and the first to land is the Mercedes SLS electric drive. But is it a genuine alternative to a supercar? The SLS electric drive is a strange mix of the familiar and unfamiliar. I know it's a bit odd to say I'm familiar with the interior of an SLS, but I did run one for a while, and it's quite conventional Mercedes in its layout. But of course, being electric, it just has a couple of slightly strange things that look profoundly different to the normal production car. To start with, we have this rev counter here that uh, shows sort of percentage of, of, of energy being used. Um, it has a battery temperature gauge and it has a battery life gauge. The centre screen is a computer readout that tells me how much, again, how much battery life I've got, because that seems to be the pertinent thing. The central screen here, well, they've taken that and now turned it into something that looks like a computer game. It's absolutely fantastic, so you'll see that now. It tells you what's going on and where torque is going. The rest of the controls are quite conventional. I've got a normal steering wheel. My paddles, they now control the amount of brake regeneration I've got. So I can either have a lot of brake regeneration, which gives massive retardation when you let off the pedal, and a lot of uh, regenerative power going back into the batteries. But it does mean that there's a car following me on the road. Um, they probably rear-end me. Um, gear lever is uh, the same as the normal SLS. You pull it back into drive. It's a bit of a whirring as the handbrake goes off. And now, in complete silence, and honestly at the moment, the loudest thing is the fan that's on two at the moment. We just roll away. And we do so in one of the three driving modes, this one called comfort. Comfort is as described. It gives us the easiest, most relaxed throttle position on the car. So we've got quite a long throttle as we push on now, doing 25, 30 miles an hour. Just remarkable. Less spring rate than I think in a standard SLS. The car's heavy, obviously, nearly 2.2 tonnes, but a bit more with uh, two people on board. I've got nice steering weight, not too light. Circuit's very slippery today. Performance, well, at the moment I've got around 440 kilowatts. You'll probably better do the math on that for you in a minute. But it does mean that if I thump my foot down, it doesn't feel as quick as a standard SLS. It doesn't. But even so, this is, in this form, in its, its most sanitised form, the SLS electric drive still feels like a proper performance car. It's still got good amounts of performance. Look at that, foot down, 60, 70, 80. That's quite quick. Ceramic brakes work well. The torque vectoring that's going on here is massively complicated. It's unbelievable because we've got four electric motors, one at each corner, and all of the torque is being monitored the whole time according to your steering angle, Lord knows what else. As a calibration exercise, this is unprecedented. So let's go into sport mode. So now I've got a slightly more responsive throttle. I've got a chassis which is trying to make things a bit sharper for me. The car feels, yeah, certainly feels a bit more responsive. This is just freakish. This whole torque vectoring thing is freakish. I think, I think torque vectoring might almost be more interesting than the fact this car is electrically driven. I, it's, it's the new snake oil of chassis design, isn't it? I mean, it almost gives infinitesimal possibilities. The fact that you can put negative torque into one wheel so the wheel that's moving the slowest in the corner, if you want, you can drag that wheel you know, back to nothing. I mean, that's incredible. Make the car just turn. And the car, this car does feel very agile for something so heavy. In comfort and sport, the car is limited to 200 kilometers per hour, so 125 miles an hour in old money. That's about fast enough, isn't it? And if you drive the car like this, i.e. not too harshly, you can probably cover about, I don't know, 160, 170 miles. If you gun it, well, yeah, it becomes a bit more um, inefficient then. Interestingly, I tried to push Mercedes on some real CO2 figures because they claim that the car is zero emissions. Well, it's not, is it? It pushes the emissions to another point in the carbon cycle. So 
if a normal SLS is 300 and something grams per kilometre, then this realistically in a northern European nation that uses a mixture of nuclear, coal and, and uh, increasingly some renewable energy sources, this is around 15 to 20 grams per kilometre. So it's still pretty efficient. Wow. That is quite alarmingly quick, even in sport mode. Now, Sport Plus. Sport Plus. I've got a much more responsive throttle now, and I now have 740 something horsepower, 1,000 Newton meters of torque, 737 foot pounds, and I'm limited to 150 miles an hour. That won't be a problem here. But this is a slippery track, so I've got to be a little bit careful. What happens? Well, the torque vectoring is doing an incredible job of keeping me on the circuit. It's very slippery today. And what it's doing is allowing each wheel to do its maximum, given the circumstances, but rather than getting really juddery brakes, it actually feels like the tyre has reached its limit of grip and just stops there. Just keep your foot planted and it's seamless and smooth. And then when it lets go in a straight line, I mean, it's, it's quick, isn't it? <laughs> Neil's speechless next to me recording the audio. <laughs> This is new. This is profoundly new. Okay. It's, it's, it's genuinely fast, guys. It's genuinely fast. I'm not sure what this means for the future of the motor car because this is £400,000 by the time you've paid a few taxes. There's no right-hand drive version. And it's a technology that's available now, but it's also massively complex. It's not ultimately as usable or as flexible as a combustion engine and it's not a car for the people is it although this is modular so imagine 740 something horsepower well you could take a third of this and stick it in an a-class and you're away not as much fun as that though i mean that is just back to the future when you squirt it down the straight isn't it blimey riley talk vectoring very very interesting now there are three modes here and we can play with them so we have the ability to switch off torque dynamics into sport now. So this allows me, again, to have a completely different chassis setup on the car. So this is less cautious, it'll allow a bit of slip. Look at that, a bit of slip. And this is all done through electronics. I mean, it's slippery as hell, and it's just managing everything for me. And it's all done on steering angle. What's really freakish about the, the dynamics of this car with the torque vectoring is that in a conventional sports car you have the same ultimate behaviour of the car and you just play with the levels of intervention. Yeah, you can put more support into the car by stiffening the dampening up and, and you can play with other bits and bobs and some cars have differentials that will change a bit as well, but ultimately the character of the car is the same. You just play with the intervention levels. With this car, when you go from comfort to Sport Plus, you have a totally different car. It feels quite different. It performs differently. The axles behave differently according to the grip levels and the amount of power being thrown at them. Bizarre. So, sport mode gives us a bit more slip. Mega. Absolutely mega. The vaguely oversteering electric car. Tell you what, though, we can try the completely oversteering electric car. That's an electric car in a skid. About five minutes ago, I was out on the track, which is wet, oversteering a four-wheel drive electric car. I, I've never done that before. So rather than stand around that car and try and have my mind blown, we've come inside to this cutaway, 
and I want some of this technology explained to me, how this works, why it works, and how they've reached this level of performance from the car, because I just wasn't expecting it. Okay, first of all, four electric motors, yeah? Four electric motors, one in each wheel. Torque split, 25% per corner. That's the basic setup, yes. But it can change. It and will change if you're driving in a dynamic way. Torque factoring will help you set the right torque on the right wheel in the right second. So we have the battery packs mainly in the center of the vehicle within the carbon structure, which is completely different to an SLS. So even though the car looks like an SLS on the outside, underneath is nothing to do with an SLS at all, is it? It's completely different. It's completely different. Uh, we changed the body in white um, in terms of the, the center of the vehicle, the spine of the vehicle. Yeah. Uh, we do have um, uh, a zero intrusion cell made out of carbon fiber, which is uh, pretty much a backbone of the vehicle, gives the body in white a lot of the stiffness that you already felt, and is uh, additional, it's an intelligent uh, way of uh, our strategy lightweight performance since that battery housing is part of the body in white. Yeah, okay. And actually, in twist, is this stiffer than a normal SLS? Yes, it is. It is? Due, due to the uh, carbon fiber housing. Okay, that's interesting. But we have a lot of mass down here. We have 550 kilograms or so, don't we, of batteries? Yes. But the, but the actual center of gravity is quite good because it's low and in the middle of the car, yes? Yes, and the center of gravity in total, in the center of the gravity of the vehicle, is about uh, an inch lower than in the regular SLS. Okay, right. The electric motors, how much power do we have coming from the front and the rear of the and the rear axle in terms of electric motor power? What, what's, what's the split? Um, each electric motor provides 138 kilowatts, yeah. so they're all four are the same. Basic setup is 25% uh, each, so the total is uh, 552 kilowatts, which is 750 horsepower. And uh, the so north... how do you say that without smiling? You've made an electric car, 750 horsepower. 750. That is utterly bad, <laughs> isn't it? Think about it. 750 <laughs> horsepower and 1,000 newton meters of torque. Carry on. Sorry, just try not to smile when you say it, right? <laughs> yeah, with the 750 horsepower, it's the most powerful electrical uh, car. And it's the most powerful AMG ever. Let's have a little look around a couple of bits and bobs. The, talk me through the cells. The cells come from South Korea? Yes. How South many cells? 70? 864. Okay, in all. And they come in blocks of three. Is it three big blocks? Um, that's actually what we see here is what we call one module. Yeah. And we do have 12 equal modules in the vehicle. Yeah. Four of these modules are mounted uh, together to yeah. a battery. Yeah. So from an electric point of view, we do have three equal batteries in a car. Okay, and I suppose from, a, from an R&D perspective, because this is an R&D project and we have to remember that, it's entirely possible to take one of those, isn't it? You could take one of those and put them in a car. Oh, you can, you won't have that much fun, but you can. Okay, well you still have a third of 750 horsepower, don't you? Yes. That's quite a lot. Yeah, that's yeah. quite By good. conventional standards. Um, how long do these last for? If you, if, you just, if you recycle them properly, if you charge them and discharge them properly, how long does that last for? Um, during development, um, we, um, we did a lot of testing in terms of cycling, of aging, um, corrosion tests, and you know, we kind of torture our components to make sure they will, they will last in customers' hands. But uh, that battery is made to last for 10 years. 10 years. Okay, so, so we're not worried about that. In terms of range, so if I drive the car normally, I don't try and drive too fast, I keep the car in comfort mode, maybe for 20% of the time I, of a full charge I have it in Sport Plus and I go a bit quicker, how many kilometers do you think? Um, the certified range is 250 kilometers, but as you said, um, the real life um, range that you, can, uh, that you can achieve in an everyday use might be around 200, yeah. this is what we expect. Even though, if you know how to drive the vehicle in an econi uh, economic way, you will be able to reach 250, but if you're uh, cruising in, let's say, more or less normal traffic, 200 is, the, is a realistic answer. Okay, 200, 125 miles, which is still a long way, given that um, I'm not used to electric cars having any range whatsoever. Um, um, just talk me through the way that each uh, gearbox works on, on each axle. Can we just have a look at that? Sure. So I, and I presume, and you'll tell me I'm wrong now when we're on video and it's recording, do we just have a reduction gear effectively here? Is that what we're doing? We're just taking a motor and reducing its speed down? But basically that's what we do. We have okay. um, one, two electric motors that are kind of facing each other. Yeah. They're mounted onto one gearbox. 
And uh, inside this gearbox, there's actually there's two independent gear, gear sets in there. So the right motor doesn't know what the left one, uh, what the left one does. They're facing to each other. There's two set of gears, and there's the drive shafts connected connected to the axles. So differential is uh, realized in an uh, electronic way, yeah. and that's why torque vectoring can tell that motor independently from this one what you want, what we want to do with the vehicle. And that is the key for the fast reaction and the, and the ability to control the vehicle in a dynamic way. Um, talk me through effectively negative torque. How do, you know the way that you can apply what you call sort of negative torque to a wheel in a situation? How does that work? Um, negative torque is, um, is is a thing that you well you, you, you might you might have difficulties to understand what negative torque means. Yeah, cool. So, if, uh, for instance, if you go through a corner on the right way, these two uh, wheels on the left-hand side, they get all the vehicle load, yes. so you can put the maximum positive torque onto these two wheels. If you're turning into, into the corner, uh, the two left uh, wheels, um, they get this uh, negative torque, and it's not that we're turning wheels backwards, it's more like breaking down uh, the wheel or kind of Try to turn it backwards. If you if you rip it off and turn it back backwards, you just then you lose rotate. the grip. Yeah. That's what that's not what you want. So you kind of break it down and kind of turn it backwards. So and by moving this way, these two have maximum torque uh, uh, positive, and that uh, these two negative. This is uh, you, you always can concept. imagine. This is it, it turns automatically without. Uh, uh, so you're not actually it. running the motor backwards. You're just pulling the torque back to zero. Right? Exactly. And that's yes. what you call negative torque. Well, we don't turn it back to zero. We, we, even, we are even able more, to turn it backwards. So it's, yeah. it's actually decelerating the wheel. Yes. And this is all done through the gearbox and the motor, nothing to do with the brake. You're not using the brake disc at all to, to trim it. Torque vectoring doesn't uh, work with, uh, with uh, uh, brakes, since you know brakes kind of it takes some time to activate them and to get the pressure there. The electric motors, they set it right uh, as you want it. Okay, I think um, I think that's about all the tech we could digest in, in that period, but that is a car that requires a lot of thinking once you've driven it, and I need to go and think now about what I've experienced, but I don't think it's a solution, an immediate solution for the super sports car, because obviously it's expensive and it doesn't quite have the range and it's heavy and it, it has some downsides, but if you told me two or three years ago that there'd be an SLS for sale that was completely electric that could perform like this, the SLS electric drive is too limited and too heavy to be a genuine replacement to a supercar, but it's much, much more exciting than I'd ever expected. This is a showcase for what's coming, and it's mostly good news, even if it looks like the smaller, lighter batteries we really need are still at least a decade away. It's a totally bizarre car. I feel like Marty McFly the moment he got into the bloody DeLorean. You made a time machine out of an SLS? <laughs> it's absolutely bizarre.